few introductory remarks at the beginning of the session. I will then invite each witness to make a short presentation to the committee. You may share your time with, with a colleague if you wish, and please indicate uh, this to me when you are invited to speak. I would ask that presenters keep their opening statements as brief as possible, because time is limited overall. When the presentations have finished, there will be time for questions and comments from the senators and responses from the witnesses. So now I have pleasure in calling on our rapporteur, Senator Khaled Keller. Thank you uh, very much, Lasko Hirlock, and like you, I'd like to warmly welcome uh, everybody here today. Uh, Grati Tom Gilles Amuni Fain on Bjors are crushed, and Ned Nedes Talux. I'm sorry now for ruining the language, but I've tried. And uh, I got those words from the lovely Owen Devordun. I would like to thank people for coming here today from far and wide, and, I, and for, I think, the record number of diverse submissions to this open call, all of which will be included and reflected in the inevitable report that we will produce. Thanks to my fellow senators, members of the Public Consultation Committee, members of the uh, Senate Civil Engagement Group, and supporters across parties and independents. I want to acknowledge and thank Bridget Doody, Carl Judge, and the Shannon team for making today happen, and for the ushers for their great support today. I would also like to mention my little team, Ben, Sarah, Katrina, Hazel, and particular thanks to the Irish Traveller Movement uh, and Traveller NGOs, and above all, Owen de Vordoon, who advised me and helped me put together a programme of work to advance traveller rights, which I am pursuing in different ways in my role as Senator. On the 1st of March uh, 2017, it was a historic day for Ireland and for travellers. This was the first day when the state formally recognised the ethnicity of Irish travellers and in doing so ushered in a new era of mutual understanding and relations. When the then Taoiseach Enda Kenny spoke to the doll recognising traveller ethnicity, he said, our traveller community is an integral part of our society <laughs> for over a millennium with their own distinct identity, a people within our people. He went on to say that recognition of travellers could have a transformative effect on relations between travellers and wider society. But despite formal, the state's formal recognition of traveller ethnicity and by extension language, culture and history, the everyday efforts that travellers make to develop their cultural literacies is systematically ignored in public and policy discourse. I'm always taken by the writings of African-American writer, civil rights activist and gay man James Baldwin, writing on identity. He was a man who grew up in 1950s Harlem and also spent many years as a writer in Paris. He wrote, my inheritance was specifically limited and limiting. My birthright was vast, connecting me to all who live and to everyone forever. But one cannot claim the birthright without accepting the inheritance. Ireland's inheritance includes our traveller history and culture. We must cherish it, celebrate it and know it for us as an Irish people to claim our birthright. We must cherish it, celebrate it and know it to redress the stigma, the long-standing prejudice, discrimination, racism, social exclusion and identity erosion experienced by travellers. We must move beyond stereotypes and begin uh, to bring into our awareness our unconscious bias through formal cultural awareness and reflection. There has been attempts at assimilation of travellers and den denial of difference. There has been segregation in many forms which make constructive conversations and dialogue well nigh impossible. Today we have an opportunity to do something different, to create a new narrative by having a different kind of conversation, a dialogue that systematically engages with traveller cultural literacies and seeks to appreciate and understand them to link the private troubles of travellers into the public issues that the state, government, agencies and bodies must connect with and address. The state looms large, particularly in the lives of travellers, and the onus is on the whole of society, the machinery of the state, government departments, agencies, public bodies, the Oireachtas, and for leaders and people in schools, hospitals, communities everywhere, everywhere to have such dialogues. Recognising the almost total absence of travellers in the Oireachtas, either as members or behind the scenes, or at least people who have self-identified as travellers, and with the same absence across the public sphere, this is why I, a settled person and not a traveller, sought to make space, make room, 
make common cause in different ways with travellers in my privileged role as senator, not to set an agenda or the agenda or to speak for, rather to listen and to use the power that I have to advance rights, justice and well-being and to be part of the gateway to an even fuller participation in politics and public life by travellers. It would be my privilege if travellers could and would consider and accept me as an ally, learning from you and the community as I go. So it is good that we are here today in Shannon, there in one of the houses of the Oireachtas, to have a good exchange, to speak, to listen, to come up with good ideas and proposals for travellers to be members of this house, to be members of the Dáil, to be councillors, to work behind the scenes, to reach the upper echelons and all parts of the civil service, Gardaí, judiciary, health and social care systems. For too long, travellers have been invisible in these worlds, excluded from these worlds, or even when in those worlds, hiding their honourable identity, like so many LBG, LGBTI people felt they had to do to survive. So as I end my opening remarks and we embark on our day of hearings, I give you words from two black civil rights activists. Martin Luther King said, nothing in all the world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. Put more simply and directly, Maya Angelou told us, when you know better, you do better. Those of us on this side of the house today will be educated by travellers and others. Our consciousness will be raised. We have many important voices to hear so that we may know better and most importantly of all, do better. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, for those opening remarks. And I now have pleasure in calling on Minister David Stubb to address us. Thanks very much, Chairman. Um, good morning, everybody, Senators, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for inviting me here today uh, to this uh, unusual but very important event. Uh, to speak at the committee hearings on the specific, specific theme of uh, traveller participation in politics. Um, these hearings, I am sure, promise to provide valuable insights on the current situation of travellers in Ireland and on issues needing to be addressed. Uh, you are aware of my long-standing commitment to improving the situation of travellers, both as Minister and formerly as Chair of the Giant Oireachtas Committee on Justice, Defence and Equality. I, I, I want to apologise at the start to Chair. My diary won't allow me to stay for the full session, but, um, um, but I, I will actually take note of what's going on and, 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 and record it later. But I will stay as long as I can. Um, significant progress has been made to recognise the contribution of travellers to our society. The recognition of travellers as an ethnic minority, as, as has been said by Senator Kelleher, uh, by the then teaching in the Kenya in March 2017, was, was a landmark occasion. The historic debate that night on travel ethnicity was memorable, each party acknowledging the significance of what was being done and of the importance of recognising and celebrating travellers' distinct identity within Irish history and life. As you may be aware, Chairman, I also chair the, national, uh, the steering committee on the, of the National Travel and Roma Inclusion Strategy, known as NITRUS. Um, and there's a, it's, it's, it's a published document. It's a living document as well. And I was glad to be able to invite Senator Kelleher to the last meeting of that. And I'm sure she will um, share with, uh, with her colleagues later on her impressions of what she saw at that particular meeting. And NITRIS is a whole of government strategy which I launched on uh, June 2017 and it's aimed at improving the lives of travellers and Roma communities in Ireland. It has been developed and is being implemented in a partnership approach with travel and Roma organisations so that their concerns are considered when national policy is being developed and so that a co collaborative responses can be put in place to address the challenges which remain to be addressed. The strategy contains a number of actions that relate specifically to this theme of traveller participation in politics. These actions were developed following an extensive consultation process during 2016 and 2017. That consultation process enabled a wide range of traveller voices to be heard on the actions needed to be in included in the strategy. The steering committee for the strategy is made up of departmental and agency representatives and of representatives of the traveller and Roma organisations. They have a role of monitoring each of the actions of the strategy. Departments and agencies ha have to report on progress on individual actions to the committee. NITRUS is being monitored according to a traffic light system which enables progress on each action to be clearly evaluated. In addition, specific actions have been prioritised for attention in 2019. These form an implementation plan for the, for the year and are subject to quarterly updates at the steering group meetings. There is no tokenism, Mr Chairman, in the inclusion of the traveller organisations on the committee. 
The members of the Committee on the Traveller Organisations are strong and influential members. Their role is a very important one in monitoring the implement, implementation of the strategy. They can and they do call government aid departments and agencies to account on the delivery of the various actions. Their participation is vital as they can shed light on the actual experience of travellers at national and local level. They are able to confirm whether or not initiatives are working in practice. The strategy commits my department to fund traveller organisations at national and local level, not only to represent and advocate for their community, but also to build the capacity within the community for the future. It is very important that the traveller community has strong representative groups who represent the community at all levels of society, be it nationally, locally or in the media. Such organisations rightly seek to improve outcomes for travellers, but equally they provide that, that crucial link for the state to interact with its traveller citizens through its various consultative mechanisms. They can also provide an alternative narrative to the criticisms that I know members of the community see, hear and read in the media on a regular basis. I see that, fund I see that funding as, uh, as of importance in developing capacity within travel organisations to undertake the particular political participation process with the national and local decision-making structures. My department, Chairman, has a budget of 3.8 million euro in 2019 to fund travel and Roma community groups, many of whom are represented here, and national-level NGOs. This funding is generally used to cover the costs of community development posts in traveller and Roma organisations. The funding has also been used to support traveller participation in decision-making and political fora. This is in response to the NITRAS actions 132 and 133 which are focused on supporting traveller and Roma people to participate in the political process at local and national levels and also to facilitate political engagement and leadership in their communities. More specifically, Action 132 calls on the Department of Housing, Planning, Community and Local Government to support, the, uh, to support of traveller and Roma organisations on voter education and voter registration um, initiatives for the traveller and Roma communities. In addition, Action 133 calls for the Department of Justice and Equality to support the development of mentoring programmes to build and develop the capacity of travellers and Roma to represent their communities at a local, <coughs> national and international level. The funding provided to Minister Whedon, for, for instance, allowed them to hold a conference on political participation in February of this year. I was delighted to be able to, uh, to address that conference and to launch their handbook on, on mobilising traveller political participation before, during and, um, and, and after elections. I have a copy of the handbook here as well, Chairman, and people might, might like to have a look at it. The conference was held in advance of the local elections in May, and I know at that time they had two members of the traveller community committed to run in the elections, and I believe at the end the figure rose to five. I seem to be correct on that, but that's my information. Yeah. yeah, okay. I, I want to commend those candidates for taking the brave steps to run for public office. Regardless of the results, it is important <coughs> that young travellers, both male and female, see their community members taking an interest in and running for public office. I know that campaigning is not an easy task, and any of us here who are politicians know that. It's not easy. I am also responsible, Chairman, for the Migrant Integration Policy and have supported initiatives to promote, to promote a migrant polit political participation. It is important that the diversity of our society should be reflected in the membership of the Iraqis in, and in local politics. The progress that we have made to achieve better gender balance in politics shows that more balanced political participation can be achieved. However, if this is to be sustained, it will require the support of political parties and independence and of the electorate, of course. If we want to see Irish society reflected in our political institutions, we are dependent on travellers, migrants and women to be brave enough to take that giant step to run for public office. We as citizens, members of the traveller community and people who are not members of the traveller community, must also ensure that we are registered to vote, that we use that vote on the day, and that we use that vote to ensure that all of Irish society is reflected in our institutions. So again, uh, I want to thank you for your invitation to speak to the committee today. I am pleased to see the range of activity being undertaken within Minister House on the situation of travellers in Ireland. I welcome the work being done by this committee, the Traveller Rockless Group, and the recently announced Committee on Key Issues Affecting the Traveller Community. And I look forward to the reports and recommendations from these groups. Uh, I will ensure that they are included in the agenda of the NITRAS Steering Committee. And I know that Traveller colleagues here will also uh, been sure that happens as well because they are very strong and very vocal on the committee as they should be and as I encourage them to be as well. Um, I believe that working together in collaboration with traveller organisations we can achieve better outcomes for travellers so that their contribution to Irish life and society can be properly understood and valued. Thank you very much Minister. Uh, I now call on Martin Collins of uh, Pavy Point and Roman Centre. On your vote, Martin. Uh, Minister, uh, Chairperson, uh, Senators, uh, ladies and gentlemen, 
uh, Paddy Coyne Traveller and Roma Centre is delighted to have this opportunity to speak to you this morning at this very historic event and to press on you the importance of traveller participation in the development, implementation and evaluation of policies and programmes designed to address inequalities and racism and promote equality and inclusion. Pavi Point, for almost 35 years, has been working at a local, national and indeed international level in the promotion and protection of traveller and Roma human rights. One of the values which inform our work is a community development approach and at its core is creating the conditions for the full and meaningful participation of travellers and Roma in analysing, identifying our own concerns and issues and identifying potential solutions. In fact, Pavi Point Traveller and Roma Centre is based on the premise that there can be no, uh, no significant or sustainable change unless travellers and Roma themselves are empowered to fully participate and influence policy that creates positive change for our communities on the ground. To this end, Pavi Point has participated in a range of consultative mechanisms at local and at, and at national levels, dealing with very challenging issues such as accommodation, education, health, employment and equality. This is what you might call participative democracy, and I think we are all still challenged to identify how we might straighten and make more effective these consultative mechanisms in terms of policy development and policy implementation. It is vitally important, important that we enhance and further develop, develop a community development funding lines for autonomous community development. And this work, uh, this work needs to be based on the All-Ireland Standards for Community Work in Ireland. In fact, many of the traveller activists and leaders who are presenting here today and those who are present uh, have been uh, a true community development uh, a process. And we're very fortunate to have such strong, articulate uh, traveller leadership at local, regional and national levels. In terms of, in terms of travellers and Roma political particip participation, a lot more effort and work is required to support traveller and Roma participation in the political process at local and at national levels. Pavi Point has over the years, along with many other groups, engaged in voter education awareness initiatives to encourage travellers to register and to vote and to stand as either independents or as members of parties. Please note that Pavi Point is apolitical and we're not affiliated or tied with any political party. In June of this year, the Affirmative Convention on the Protection of National Minorities, a Council of Europe legally binding instrument, published its opinion on Ireland. And one of the recommendations that the Advisory Committee made, and it calls for Irish authorities to consider in consultation with representatives of the Traveller and Roma communities, legislative practical measures to create the necessary conditions for their political participation, including representation at all levels, to more adequately reflect the composition of Irish society and better take into account the needs of the Traver and Roma communities. Also the OSCE, the Organisation for Security and Cooperation in Europe, of which Ireland is a member, a member of, published a set of recommendations on the effective participation of national minorities in public life. This is titled the Lund Recommendations. These recommendations provide guidance to member states on how best to ensure the participation of national minorities within their states. The recommendations cover general principles such as participation in decision making, including arrangements at central, regional and local levels in elections, advisory and consultative bodies and self-governance structures. Chairperson, I am fortunate enough to have been appointed as a member of the Advisory Committee on the Fermi Convention on the Protection of, of National Minorities. Article 15 of that convention talks about the participation of national minorities in, 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 in various political structures. I've had, uh, uh, I was very fortunate to visit Georgia and, uh, and, uh, and Spain, and they have created very inclusive structures there for, for indigenous uh, ethnic groups in terms of uh, being involved in decision-making processes. Likewise, in Romania, for Roma, they have created a very innovative uh, structure where Roma have a voice in the national, in the national parliament. Likewise, uh, from reading material, uh, the Sami community have their own parliament in Finland. So there are innovative, innovative ways to create the inclusion and the participation and give a voice to indigenous ethnic groups such as travellers. And we can do that by creating affirmative action policies. Uh, we can look, for example, at having quotas of travellers in our national parliament. We can, have, we can look at the whole concept of reserve, reserve seats, which is a tried and trusted method of supporting the inclusion of, of indigenous groups right across Europe. 
And to, find, uh, to, uh, to conclude, I just want to take this opportunity uh, to, to highlight an example. Recently, as you know, uh, Dr Cindy Joyce was appointed to the Council of State. I think that was a really significant and a very symbolic uh, 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 development, and we need to see a lot more in, in, in that regard. I think when travellers look at our, our Parliament, at both houses of the Oireachtas, you know, we need to see our faces reflected, reflected in these parliaments. And if that were to happen, I think it would deconstruct, uh, deconstruct this notion that our parliament is the sole preserve of the majority population. So I look forward to the hearings. I look forward to uh, engaging in the questions and answer session. And more importantly of all, I look forward to the report and the recommendations that it might contain. And even more so, I look forward to the full implementation of those recommendations. We've had a lot of strategies, a lot of policies, but the challenge that remains is the full implementation. And if these policies and recommendations are fully implemented, there's absolutely no doubt they will greatly enhance and improve things for Traveller and Roma community. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And now I call on Mr. Patrick McDonough, PhD student from Trinity College, Dublin. Where you go, Patrick? Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Chairperson. I'm Patrick McDonough, a PhD in Medieval History at Trinity College Dublin, and as I've been invited to contribute my opinions on how to strengthen travellers' participation in politics. This was one of my first, and I think, I think one of the first steps that would, I think would make an important difference going forward would be the creation of a senatorial seat for travellers, or indeed just one traveller as, as the preliminary steps. And I, this system and our current, our current political system has, I would think, there's already in a similar case, currently the universities of Ireland have six seats in regards to the Irish Senate. My own university, Trinity College, has three, and the National University of Ireland also have three, and, the, and Article 18 of the Irish Constitution provides for this. I think if a, if a similar proposal were made, for a separate article, for, for a traveller's seat, it would be in line with this, and I think it would go for a first step, for despite the good work of, Minister, of Deputy Minister Staunton and Senator Kelleher, it is my opinion that the, the trust that tra Irish travellers would feel towards the Irish states, I would feel is, is more or less non-existence. I, that's not, obviously that's not, of course, unique to the Irish state, it, it, it applies to the United, Kingdom's, United Kingdom, myself being from Northern Ireland, but I think as a way forwards, it would make it a symbol because Irish travellers, when they look at our political system, they do not see Irish travellers' presence. Now, of course, there, is, there was, of course, Patrick McLaughlin, who was a TD several years ago for Donegal, and that, uh, whose mother and grandmother were Irish travellers, which was an important step. But, the, but he's an exception and a rarity, and there, is n there seems to be no sign that it will be anything part of the mainstream. And it would be important, I think, for the four major parties, Fine Gael, Fianna Fáil, Labour, and indeed Sinn Féin as well, to increasingly select travellers to run at all levels, be it at council, TD, or MEP, or indeed to also run separately for senator. And I think this goes on to my next point about the best way, I think, to strengthen Irish travellers' participation is in, essentially in education. I'm the first in my family to go to university, and I'm currently the first to be asked to speak in this room. Currently, the, the number of Irish travellers in university is essentially non-existent. It's irrelevant almost. I'm one of quite a few. I'm currently the only one, I think, doing a PhD in Trinity College Dublin. Currently, Cindy Joyce is the only one from the University of Limerick to, to have been awarded a PhD. And it's likely those them. I'll be very surprised if that number goes above 10 in the next 10 years. And, and I, so one, one of the main barriers, I think, is, is, is I would recommend the creation of an Irish Traveller Pacific scholarship, at least be recommended and proposed, because when travellers do, of course, view the university system, and indeed the secondary education system, they don't see a system that necessarily that fits in for them. It's barriers. It's not like their parents have went and can explain the system. And, and, and obviously your barriers, be that financial costs, because fears of being identified as a traveller, and just will, will it actually, will, what does it actually result in? And I think there could be great work that could be done both between Irish travellers organisations and Irish state, and it's promoting that. But I think the provision of a dedicated financial scholarship for Irish travellers on this island to study university would go a great deal 
in actually encouraging them. And once those people are entering the educational system and they're more aware of how this, the state organ operates, they're less mystified by how it operates and they're more willing, I think, to effect change and they're more willing not to be t lectured by someone else. Irish travellers can't expect others to speak for them if they're not willing to speak for themselves. And I think a gr a education, I think, will be one of the great motivations in driving and changing that. And it is good to see that there are increasingly there are more Irish travellers attending third level education. But it's still a far, it's still a long, long way to go before we're, we're approaching anything, actually approaching our proportion to the population. 40,000 Irish travellers in the Irish Republic, 6,000 in Northern Ireland. There is under 200 attending the Irish universities, which is, a, which, which is an, an insignificant number. And I suppose linked to this, this idea of increasing travel education is, I know currently before the Shannon in the fourth stage, there's the Irish Traveller History and Culture Bill, which Senator Callagher and Senator Lynn Ruan have, have done some great work on. And I think that would be an important step because as well as those travellers entering education, if Irish travellers are to take part in the Irish states, they have to know their history in both the Irish state and before the Irish states. It's not that long ago that the, there was the myth that Irish travellers date from the famine. And then, of course, there's the idea of, do the Irish travellers, is it from the Cromwellian periods? Is it the, is it the dissolution of the monasteries at the Tudor periods? And, of course, these are questions that can only be answered if more work are done in those areas and, and are to be taught. I mean, there are nomadic groups in late medieval Ireland. Catherine Sims, a former lecturer in Trinity College, has an article on nomads in medieval Ireland about O'Connors who were sent to the, who were pushed to the west of Ireland. Are they travellers? It's it obviously it's to be difficult to say, but they're certainly a nomadic group. And I think by bringing in a bill that, that teaches traveller history and Irish, the history of Irish nomadism more broadly, I think it would help give travellers and other people who, who, from a nomadic background on this island just to see a way of how they fit in onto the history of this island. Because all too often, Irish travellers are seen as the aberration, the freaks, whatever you, you want to call it. So I think a problem that needs to be fixed, to be dealt with, or whether it be assimilation, or just pure, or, or by ignoring them. And I think by, by the introduction of bills like that, by the promotion of Irish travellers entering education, and, and by run, and encouraging them, whether for a deliberate policy of, of deliberately selecting them for running in local elections, TD or, or above, and the creation of these seats, I think that will go, certainly it would mark a beginning of what was still quite a long journey to giving travellers a role in the state proportionate to our place and population within it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. And I'll call on Kathleen Sherlock, coordinator, Minster Sweden. Away you go, Kathleen. Uh, thank, uh, thank you. On behalf of uh, Minker Sweden, uh, Can for Travellers Talk in Ireland's only all travel forum, I would like to thank the Senate Public Consultation Committee um, on Irish Travellers for the opportunity to give Minker Sweden's input on today's discussion. Um, and also thank Minister Santon, who has been completely supportive to Minker Sweden and to the um, uh, better outcomes for travellers um, and all the ministers and senators that are here today. Thank you. Um, the area Minka Whedon will speak on is on the subject and parts of traveller political participation. Um, before we get to that subject, though, uh, I will give a brief outline of who Minka Whedon is, our objectives and our work. Minka Whedon can't for Travellers Talk in Ireland's own, only to all travel forum was formed in 2004 with the focus of creating a safe space where travellers could come together to discuss issues affecting our community and identify collective responses to those uh, issues. Our membership is open to all members of the travel community. Our mission is to promote the recognition and understanding of Irish travel culture and identity as Ireland's only Indigenous ethnic minority group who have been part of the fabric of Irish society for over a millennium. We work towards the full participation and inclusion of Irish travellers in all aspects of economic, social, culture and political life in Ireland, where our community is treated with respect and equality. Our people can be proud and confident, of, confident to hold up their travel identity without fear or prejudice. We believe in equality and justice and work in solidarity with human rights groups and organisations. 
when we talk about the issues affecting our, our community, we need to be clear on what these issues are. These are critical issues about life and death, about survival, and not um, simply about culture and cultural identity, which is very, very important to the travel community, but the actual survival of our people. Uh, we currently have a total traveller population of under 40,000 people. And that's an astonishing small number for a community of people who have been part of this country for over a millennium. To try to get grips on why the travel population is so small, we only have to look to the findings from researchers on the, on the, on the Irish travel community. Uh, the, the 2010 All-Ireland Health Study, the ERSRI Report upon Travel Community, Behaviour and Attitude Research on Travellers. From these researches, we know that 75% of travellers are under the age of 35. Half of all travellers will die before the age of 40. The remainder will only reach into our early 60s, if we're lucky, with a tiny number reaching 70 years of age or beyond. Uh, this is painful and devastating reality for the <laughs> travel community. For this to be a reality in any community anywhere in the world in the 21st century would be shocking. That it's happening in Ireland, uh, one of the most developed and advanced countries in the world, is very, very difficult to understand. But understand that we must. That means looking directly into the experiences for the travel community in Ireland, um, what it is and the challenges our community face. Uh, the deepening crisis in travel accommodation, the escalating uh, rates of suicide, chronic ill health as a result of poverty and poor living conditions, 84% unemployment, poor educational attainments. We're excluded, we're marginalised, we experience blatant discrimination on an ongoing basis because of our traveller identity. For decades, travel groups and travel activists have campaigned for fair treatment and equality uh, for, for um, and, excuse me, have, uh, have campaigned for the travel community. This continues to be an uphill battle as we see our community rapidly deteriorating before our eyes. As travel activists and development workers within the community, we are very aware that the travel community is going through a crisis situation, the likes of which we have never experienced before. We recognise that anti-travel bias that exists within Irish society does play a part in this crisis. However, it must be stated, as painful as it is, that the root cause of the result is of successive Irish government's actions and inactions relating to the travel community. There's no community of people in Ireland that has been so negatively impacted by political decisions and political inactions as the travel community. And we certainly hope there never will be a community that experience that again. Minka Whitten is calling on political leaders and politicians from all political parties to recognise the underlying cause in the crisis situation the travel community is in and to take decisive actions and implement policies to undo the, the damage of the past uh, that will set about creating better outcomes for the travel community now and into the future. An important step was the Irish state's recognition of travel ethnicity on the 1st of March 2017. We'll see that as a, as, as a forward move. Irish travel, political participation and partic uh, political representation. Minka Whitten recognised that for real change to happen for the travelling people, the travel community must have a voice in the decision-making arenas. To this end, over the past number of years, Minka Whitten has dedicated a significant proportion of our time and energy and work into raising the awareness of political uh, awareness of the importance of travel political participation within the travel community, develop, delivering travel specific voter education training. In February 2019, we held a National Traveller Political Participation Conference, the first of its kind in Ireland, where we launched our <coughs> Political Participation Training Handbook, which Minister Stanton showed already, mobilising Irish traveller political participation before, during and after the elections. At, uh, at this conference, three traveller candidates launched their campaign for the 2019 local elections. As a result of the conference, two other, traveller mem two other members of the travel community also ran as election candidates. Having five members of the travel community running as political candidates was a historic, for, uh, historic event for our community. It's important to build on, uh, on this and support future travel political participation. Um, uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, a society 
uh, we ha as a society, we have to recognise the, the challenges facing members of the travel community contesting elections, the anti-travel bias, and, as, and, and how small our community is. Irish travellers make up less than um, half of one, just over half of one percent of the general population. There is a need to implement legislative positive, positive measures to ensure travellers' inclusion in political participation at local and national level. Irish travellers remain largely excluded from decision making and wider political process. Regardless of commitments in the National Travel Roma Inclusion Strategy, recommendations by the Advisory Committee for the Protection of the National Minorities, the UN Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Um, to date, Irish state has not adopted actions or positive measures to improve the representation of travellers and political uh, institutions and decision making. So our recommendations are for the state to undertake legislative and positive measures to ensure travellers' inclusion and political participation within local and national government, to reserve seats for members of the travel community within the Dáil, uh, Dáil Éireann, the Senate and local councils, to support traveller political participation and training and poli political represent re representation training. Uh, traditionally, travellers have, be have been on the margins of society and we don't have a background to be part of the decision-making process. To address this, there is a need for an in-depth training within the travel community to get them ready to be political representatives. Um, to ensure meaningful consultation with the travellers' uh, organisations um, and enhance their role in developing and monitoring policy responses to travel, uh, travel development. To incorporate decision-making powers within travel consultative structures and resource independent national uh, independent national and local traveller organisations to ensure travellers are mainstreamed into a range of social inclusion initiatives at local and national level. To create employment opportunities for members of the travel community within all government departments and internships as a measure to address the 84% unemployment within the travel community. To implement effective hate speech legislation that specifically names Irish travel community that continues to be negatively impacted by discrimination and racism. To instruct strong measures to ensure travellers are not negatively targeted by political candidates in election campaigns. To develop, new housing, uh, to develop a new housing accommodation legislation, which will include sanctions for local authorities who do not meet their obligations on the travel community. Um, Department of Health, HSE, to publish and implement the National Travel Health Action Plan as a matter of urgency, including the establishment of planning advisory body for travellers' health with dedicated staff and budgets to drive its delivery and implementation. Alongside this as a priority, the government needs to address the very serious mental health crisis within the travel community that is claiming far too many, that is fair, claiming far too many lives and leaving devastated families, including very young orphan children behind. Thank you, Kathleen. I now also would like to welcome Rosalind McDonough, who has joined us since the start. You're very welcome. And I understand you'd like to say a few words. So over to you. Good morning, and, and thank you for the opportunity. As a graduate of Trinity College, I ran as an independent four times for the Senate. Although there was warm and well wishes for me as a traveler, the atmosphere was very hostile. I didn't have the social or political mobility or connection to find support or allies within the Arachtus, within the Senate, and therefore I was at a huge disadvantage. During those four years, at uh, different elections, I received letters, phone calls that were absolutely derogatory about my gender, about my ethnicity, and about my disability. One of the letters said that if I just went back where I was from, 
and live on an island away from the rest of the population that the, the Irish democracy wouldn't be ruined with the loss of me running. The experience of running as an independent four times while personally it was very fruitful and I learned a lot but on a collective level I concur with my colleague Martin Collins who highlighted the need for affirmative action and dedicated seats for drivers and in closing, I suppose I would also add, there are no traveler civil servants. No, there's no traveler senior civil, civil servants. And therefore, the impetus to elevate travelers into democracy still falls short of a gateway into politics. And I just feel, and I wouldn't be the first one to say it, having someone like Lynn, Lynn Rand from a, a very working class background has really enriched the debate in the Senate in various different ways. And in order to imbue a far more diverse richness within democracy, we need travelers. Now is the time, now is the moment, and we need courage as a political system to open the gates. That's all I want to say. Thank you, Rosalind. Uh, I now call on Mr. John Lonergan, uh, former governor of Montreal Prison. John. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, I just want to bring, I suppose, my own experience. I was asked to, to share some of my own experience of prison. Um, I, the first comment I make, I think, is that from my experience over the years, crime and antisocial behaviour is probably the one thing that gives the greatest amount of oxygen to, to uh, negative uh, perception of the travelling community. Um, the media play a big part in that and, and uh, sometimes politicians, um, but the highlighting of an individual crime, if it is related to a member of the travelling community, will uh, arouse instant anger and a huge amount of antagonism, um, leading to a biasness and, and a prejudice. And that is, is one of the biggest single areas uh, that crime can play a huge negative uh, and have a huge negative impact on uh, perceptions and indeed attitudes of people. I found that um, w one of the one of the things that I found, and I just want to put it out on the record, um, that in, in some ways the more progress you make in in relation to integration, and the greater difficulties you create in other ways. Because um, in prison in the old days, uh, I can go back 50 years, and um, members of the travelling community were readily and easily identifiable. Um, they, they lived together often. There was a cell, believe it or not, in Mountjoy, an A division, known as the caravan. Um, and that got its name from the fact that maybe 10 or 12 members of the travelling community who were in prison uh, resided in that particular cell. And other prisoners christened it the, uh, the caravan. But you can see the consequences of that day because they were stigmatised. Um, all the dirty jobs in prison in those days were given to members of the travelling community. And that meant that they were unconsciously discriminated against and they did not participate in a wide uh, variety of other activities. So the, 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 the prisoner community itself, uh, and this continues to this day, would have a very negative attitude to members of the travelling community. They, they, were, they would see themselves as better than. 
uh, a real old Irish thing that I'm better than. And even that, that, that is even, that can surface regu uh, regularly in prison as well. And that creates difficulty. Um, the identity thing is something for the, for the representatives of the travelling community, indeed for, for our society in general, to, to take on board because, as I said, the, the, the greater the, the improvement is made and the greater progress in integration, um, the more difficult it is to identify. And as I was governor of Mount Shai for many years, there were many people from the travelling community in prison and I never knew they were from the travelling community. Indeed, I, the only time I often knew was when they said it themselves, uh, for, uh, sometimes in arguments that they did they would argue that you were discriminating against them because they were. We wouldn't have this information. People don't understand often that the information that people assume comes with a person going to prison is actually not there at all. Uh, very little information, sometimes none, in relation to the background of people come with them when they're committed to prison. So the idea that the establishment has the information around the background of people uh, is not there. And so that, uh, that whole idea, I think, of identity is certainly a difficulty uh, in, in putting in place uh, facilities and, and, and supportive systems. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I came across was that um, one of the greatest uh, facilities to change uh, perception is involvement and participation, as, as, as people have mentioned. Um, I found myself, uh, so I came across some amazing uh, uh, performances and, and achievements by members of the travelling community when they were involved in activities, uh, creative activities uh, in the prison, and educational activities in the prison, and so I, I suppose I, 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 I would identify opportunity as being crucial. But we, so you provide opportunity for people to participate. And the 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 second element, a huge element of it, is uh, confidence. Uh, a lot of people from the travelling community that I met would not participate because they hadn't the confidence to participate. They didn't think they would be able to. They felt inferior or they felt lack of... Uh, and, and that prevented them, even if they were encouraged, uh, they, they still found that, that difficult. So um, the whole area of healthcare, which was mentioned already, a huge issue. Um, in terms of prison as well, the one good thing, a positive thing about prison is that it can and does provide a lot of that sort of inter, uh, um, intervention that wouldn't take place on the outside. Um, but so healthcare would be a, a very significant element. Um, males in particular would be, uh, I would have found a different experience generally with women uh, from the tribal community in prison. They were certainly more likely to involve themselves in healthcare issues and looking after their health uh, rather than men. Men, not just confined to the, tra the travelling community, I want to emphasise, but men generally uh, don't and uh, are reluctant to participate in preventative medicine, uh, to go for checkups, uh, you know, preventing things happening. Prison is and has the opportunity to do that, uh, but it does need the involvement. So one of the difficulties is often getting the consent and agreement and, it, uh, you know, a motivation of people to participate. Uh, the services are often there, but they're not availed of because people don't uh, come forward themselves to make, to, uh, to use the services that are there. Um, education is the very same. One of the definitely in my mind, just want to support Patrick, there is no question in my mind, but education is the most significant element of the whole change process. Uh, the more educated people are, the better they know their rights, the, better, the more confidence they have to fight for their rights, because sometimes you have to do that. Um, and then I suppose my last uh, comment would be in terms of the prisoner community itself. Um, that is a huge issue in relation to the education of the prisoner community itself in order that they are aware. Because believe it or not, I would say the greatest discrimination and the greatest amount of bullying take place in prison populations because of the culture. And the culture is irrespective of what wrong is done to you. Part of the culture is but you don't report it. You don't grasp. You don't rat as it's known within the prison community. That is a huge impediment to bringing about the type of equality and the type of human rights that are absolutely essential. If you don't have the information, if you don't have the support, you can't often deal with the difficulties. So there are a lot of, of issues. Uh, the prisoner uh, community is a small community relative to Ireland. The number of travellers involved in the prison community uh, is also very, very small, but very significant. And finally, uh, my own experience is that uh, members of the traveller community find prison very, very difficult uh, because of its confinement, because of the whole, whole structures of prison. Uh, people who are used to uh, maybe open space, freedom, in that sense of freedom, they find the confinement of prison 
very, very difficult. John. And now, Chair, excuse me, sorry, the stage. Thank you. Mike Minister, of course. And thank you. Um, and now call on Bernard Joyce, Director, Irish Traveller Movement. Bernard. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, thank you, Senators. And thank you, Minister. And, um, and also, um, I'd just like to welcome members of our community who are in the audience today. As the Director of the Irish Traveller Movement, which is a national membership-based traveller-led organisation, I welcome the opportunity to present to you today on the matter post-traveller ethnicity, recognised in 2017. Our submission crosses all of the teams and makes a range of recommendations, but from here I will focus on specific challenges to traveller quality opportunity to public decision making. There are many reasons that have either stopped or curtailed travellers from accessing and contributing to key decision making structures locally and nationally and the biggest cause is our experience of social exclusion and discrimination which has alienated us from mainstream systems of governance. Ironically, all too often those decision-making structures have been at the heart of further marginalisation of travellers by either imposing draconian laws that have Im impacted on our culture, our nomadic traditions in a negative way. Critically, we have not had national political representation since the foundation of the Irish state and continue to be invisible within the political establishment. The invisibility of the, of the diversity, capacity and insight which we as travellers can contribute across all aspects of Irish life is contradictory to an open inclusive democracy and is not coherent with the recommendations by the, by the Advisory Committee for the Protection of National Minorities the UN Committee on the Committee on Elimination of Racial Discrimination, CERD, and the former Council of Europe Commissioner for Human Rights, which noted the Irish state has not adopted positive action measures to improve the representation of travellers in political institutions and decision-making. Despite the traveller community, activism has challenged inequality and has advanced politicised human rights movement underpinned by community development values that is best placed to advocate on the issues affecting our community. There are so many strong advocates within our community and are here today, some of whom are participating in local traveller accommodation consultative committees. However often the role is not valued They've not been listened to or heard and at times often patronised in, a situation that, in situations some have walked out in recent years with no positive outcomes from their participation. These tokenistic, ineffective structures are counterproductive to what should be the state and the community's collective aim and cause huge frustrations given our experience of the crisis in mental health, suicide, homelessness, high unemployment and racism and our health stats with half our community only reaching beyond the age of 40. That's absolutely shocking. The impact has been profound. Travellers ask me and ask others, does your representation hold any value or worth after all these years? We've had poor outcomes from our participation and this can undermine traveller participation and we are, we are in fact, are we in fact colluding with the Irish state, dominated by non-travellers on the status quo. Up to now the political system has not created mechanisms to confirm the traveller voice, like gender quotas. We must be proactive in changing the system. This is why the following recommendations are important by the Irish Traveller Movement, and I'll go into them. There should be a designated place for travellers 
in the Shannard elected by the community. That a rapporteur for travellers should be appointed to the House of the Oireachtas, and there is, a, there is continu continuity to work on newly established joint committee on travellers. That a panel expert group be appointed, state partners and bodies, regulating bodies where, where in, where in participate matters of potential relevance arising, for example, the Rental Tenancy Board, the Broadcast Authority of Ireland, the Press Council of Ireland, the Enterprise Ireland, the Workplace Relations Commission. The Government will direct local authorities to ensure traveller representation in local democracy and tar actively target travellers on boards and, and committees and decision-making forums specifically. And I'll go through my final points. Carol, look. In public participation in terms of public partnership network, the Traveller Interag Interagency Committees across all local authorities and strategic policy committees. In tourism, heritage, sports, art, community development, enterprise, social inclusion. The re representation is visible and should not be restricted to voluntary efforts at specific national strategy strategies to tackle traveller employment with a priority requirement on statutory bodies, semi-body agencies and public service would have to double their efforts and establishment of a paid internship for travellers across all public bodies. There is an adoption of universal ethnic identifiers across the government and departments of public services and government and public semi-state bodies. I just want to add, uh, Cahirlach, that being here today is a very historical moment. And just to acknowledge that, um, there are people who come before us, like Nan Joyce, who ran for elections in 1982. She never got here. But I think, it's, you know, that we, ha we are here. And I think it's really significant that we need to ensure that progression, those steps, are moved forward. Um, and I just want to maybe just add, just in terms of... Um, a quote by Martin Luther, Qu Martin Luther King, um, sorry, um, it was actually Nelson Mandela, um, but I think it's re really important. Um, to deny people their human rights is to challenge their humanity. And I think for travellers for so long, we have been challenged, but so has our humanity been challenged. So I look forward to the recommendations that comes out today and also in terms of the implementation of those recommendations, in terms of traveller participation right across all sectors of our society, including the political establishment. Thank you. Cahirlach. Thank you, Bernard. I now call uh, Joanna Corcoran of the Galway Traveller Movement. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Joanna Corcoran. I'm a member of the Traveller community. I live in Galway City. I'm one of the community employment supervisors with Galway Traveller Movement and I've worked from a human rights and community work perspective for the last nine years. I'm, a very, pas I'm very passionate about equality and challenging social injustice and I'm willing to work to improve the situation for my community but I also need a system that is actually willing to work with me to address these issues. I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to present to you today. According to the census of 2016, Galway is the county with the highest population of travellers in, in the country. The population of travellers was 4,245 individuals, representing 1.6% of the total population. For those of you who are not familiar with Galway Travel Movement, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about us. We were established in 1994. We're an independent traveller organisation for Galway City and County, made up of travellers and non-travellers. We've worked for more than two decades to challenge and respond to the structural inequalities experienced by the traveller community. GTM's work has always been rooted in an understanding of and respect for the distinct culture and ethnic identity of the traveller community. It's important that the official recognition of traveller ethnicity is translated into tangible improvements in the situation and experiences of the traveller community. GTM's vision is to achieve full equality for travellers and the participation of travellers in social, economic, political and cultural life, as well as the broader enhancement of the social justice and human rights. So to get to the subject of promoting and supporting increased involvement of travellers in decision-making process within the public sphere, the Goy Traveller Movement recommends that the Irish state needs to ensure the meaningful inclusion of the voice and the perspectives of the traveller community at all levels of decision making. 
to ensure that the traveller participation is meaningful, checks and balances need to be put in place and systems that, to be developed that would ensure transparency and accountability. We need to ensure that members of the traveller community are protected under all legislation. We need to ensure the full participation of travellers in political and public life at local, regional and national level. This needs leadership and resourcing at, at an interna institutional level. The barriers to traveller participation must be removed. A greater value needs to be put on the expertise that the traveller community bring to the decision-making table. Traveller cultural action needs to be meaningful. There should be an independent assessment carried out on all legislation and policies that have a negative impact on the traveller community or on the expression of traveller culture. Legislation and policies found to have ne negative impact need to be reviewed in line with the IREC 2014 Act. Equality outcomes for traveller community needs to be prioritised across all social policy areas. GTM calls for the full implementation of the public sector duty as defined in Article 42 of the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission Act 2014, which reads, a public body shall, in the performance of its functions, have regard to the need to a. eliminate discrimination, b. promote equality of opportunity and treatment of its staff and the persons to whom it provides services, and c. protect the human rights of its members, staff and the persons to whom it provides services. The development of a new national anti-racism strategy would be essential to ensure that equality issues for the traveller community are mainstreamed. There needs to be an interdepartmental cross-sector approach to eliminating racism against the traveller community. We need to develop and enact hate crime legislation where travellers are named for specific protection. We need to ensure that traveller children's rights are protected as part of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So, Traveller representation on the local traveller accommodation consultative committee, which as set out in housing a traveller accommodation at 1998, which Barney just talked about a bit. Those members of the traveller community are represented on the LTACCs, but were not protected from very real anti-traveller discourse that's allowed and accepted in these meetings. The negative attitude and prejudice that is widespread in Irish society gets reflected within these meetings. And this is something I personally have experienced firsthand as a local rep. This should not be allowed to continue. The power imbalance needs to be redressed. Respect and dignity being central values for success and all representation. <coughs> GTM recommends a full review and overhaul of the LTACC to include, but not limited to, the development of an agreed terms of, of reference, the development of a communication strategy and working protocol for members, monthly progress reports to be circulated to all reps, Anti-racism, equality, non-discrimination and cultural competency training should be provided and mandatory and repeated at regular intervals for all staff, LTACC and housing SPC members. Meaningful participation in the decision-making with a view to getting real results for the traveller community and public accountability, an LTACC which is accountable to the traveller community. GTM has produced two reports detailing the violation of the traveller community human rights in relation to living in substandard conditions on most of the Galway city and county Halton sites and group housing schemes. You can get a copy of those reports from us if you just email us. Um, the experience to date has been there's a lack of a complete lack of political will to deliver on tra traveller accommodation programmes. Traveller children, young people and adults should enjoy an adequate standard of living compatible with a life of dignity. Traveller children should be able to live and grow up in safe, healthy, sustainable and child friendly environment that supports their developmental and learn need, learning needs. So just in conclusion, we'd like, we need to challenge structural inequality in all its manifestations. Members of the travelling community should have a right to participate. There needs to be public campaigns to address the negative public attitudes towards the traveller community and members of the traveller community need to be central to the development of any such programmes because there should be nothing for us without us. Members of the traveller community need to be legally protected. I want the recognition of my traveller ethnicity to be more than symbolic gesture. Our culture matters and we are proud. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. And now we have both Rachel Doyle and Dan Irwin from Community Work Ireland. Are you sharing time? Yes. Two and a half minutes each. That's fine. Okay. We're doing a double act here this morning. That's all right. Away uh, you go, so, uh, Rachel. Cahirlach uh, and members of the committee, senators, um, thank you for inviting us to present this morning on key issues of 
significant importance uh, for travellers. Um, we just want to do a, a, a quick background to our own organisation, um, present some of the issues in relation to the, the participation of travellers in, in decision making, um, and also present some recommendations, some of which are in our submission that we've already sent in. My own name is Rachel Doyle, as you've said, I'm a community development worker, and I've worked um, and been involved in traveller organisations for about the last 25 years, um, as has my colleague Anne Irwin, who will present later. We've both also been involved in the production of reports recently, myself uh, writing the report on traveller women in prison, uh, produced by the St Stephen's Green Trust and Anne, um, a recently produced publication on travellers and horse ownership. Our own organisation, Community Work Ireland, is a national network that supports and, and promotes community development as a means of intervention for social change and equality, so we're a national membership organisation of community workers. Um, commun just to say a bit about community development and Martin and, and Bernard have both referred to community development as an underpinning process of the work of many traveller organisations. So community development is a discipline, it's an internationally recognised approach to promoting equality, social justice and human rights. Community development works from the principles of participation, collectivity, community empowerment, social justice and sustainable um, human rights, equality and anti-discrimination. Um, and we look forward to the forthcoming production of the new strategy for the, which the Department of Rural and Community Development are about to, uh, to publish on community development and supports for the community sector because this will be very relevant for work with travellers. Over the past 35 years, our organisation has held strong ties with the organisations here. ITM, the National Traveller Women's Forum, Pavi Point, and people working in those organisations have helped to shape our organisation and to shape community development in Ireland. Travellers have led out on a lot of that work um, over the past three decades. <clears throat> And, and in turn, Community Work Ireland has tried to, I suppose, share that space in terms of promoting rights for travellers as well. Um, a key focus of our work is in ensuring that the voices of those who experience the highest levels of social exclusion, inequality and discrimination are present, listened to and heeded in the decision-making and policy-making structures and processes that affect their lives. Anne is just going to run through some of the key issues in relation to this theme. So just in terms of a number of, of issues, both from the perspective of our work with Community Work Ireland and the perspective that we both share as non-traveller members and supporters of the, the traveller movement. And when Galway Traveller Movement was established in, in, in um, 1994, both Rachel and I were very, very involved in that. And we would say that despite developments towards advancing the position of travellers in Ireland, obviously most notably by the formal recognition of traveller ethnicity and the more recent launch of the, Nav the National Traveller um, uh, uh, Traveller and Roma Inclusion Strategy, it's clear that little has changed for many travellers. The experience of oppression, discrimination and racism by travellers are well documented and acknowledged nationally and internationally. And whilst these themes will be discussed in the next session, the issues are pertinent and require a specific attention when discussing the matter of traveller participation in decision making processes within the public sphere. And as Joanna has already alluded to, such processes and the structures, committees and boards established to promote them are frequently reflective and representative of society at large and the attitudes and values that prevail. And therefore, it's not surprising that the experiences of travellers, while some are positive, the very many of them, the vast majority of them, can be characterised by travellers not being listened to, um, tokenism, frustration, all the way up to experiences of obstruction, direct hostility, expressions of prejudice and discrimination from non-traveller committee members in a range of fora. We feel we need to ask how people are appointed to decision-making committees, particularly those that affect traveller lives at local and national level. In many instances, there appears to be no prerequisite that members of these committees have any track record in the promotion of equality and human rights. And indeed, as mentioned, some are proactively anti-traveller and hostile to progress with regard to traveller rights. 
We'd also like to draw attention, as Bernard has already done, to the fact that represent, representation by travellers tends to be limited to traveller-specific committees and traveller-specific issues and themes. And we would argue that this needs to change so that traveller voices are heard in a variety of fora dealing with a variety of themes, such as planning, arts, culture, climate change, etc. You'll hear later from the National Traveller Women's Forum, but we would like to take this opportunity to highlight the need for a specific focus on traveller women in the development of any programmes or policies seeking to promote the participation of travellers. As highlighted by the National Traveller Women's Forum, traveller women play a central role in traveller society. Within the traveller movement in Ireland, traveller women have played a significant role in the development of traveller organisations and in this arena have made a valuable contribution to the, to the improvement of lives of travellers. Over the last 10 years, a significant number of traveller women have progressed from working in traveller organisations in a voluntary to a paid capacity, representing a significant and positive development for both women, traveller women and traveller organisations alike. The National Strategy for Women and Girls, the monitoring committee for which my colleague Rachel sits on, notes that if women are to change their circumstances fundamentally, they need to have greater access to the levels of power across Irish society. We also need to ensure that disadvantaged women, older women, women with disabilities, traveller and Roma women and migrant women can participate in key decisions concerning their lives. And it states, in view of the historic underrepresentation of traveller and Roma women in leadership, in leadership positions, measures will specifically be taken to provide great, greater opportunities for traveller and Roma women to participate in leadership, including in the community and voluntary sector. And just a final note for me before I pass over to Rachel to talk about just a, a short number of recommendations, just a note on the critical role that community development has played in the development of leadership within the traveller community. As a number of my colleagues have already stated, community development is usually behind many of the traveller leaders that have emerged um, over, the, over the past number of decades, and we would strongly suggest that, that specific support should be given to this. Thank you very much, and, and we now move on to... Kevin Bond. So, sorry, Chairperson. I just wanted to finish with a couple of recommendations, if that's okay. We'll, we'll allow that, even though you're gone two to three minutes over time. Sorry. sorry. Okay. Um, they did tell you. They did warn you. I hope they did. They certainly did. There. It's our fault. As these um, senators know when it comes to time. <laughs> senators, you're very welcome. We'll come to you in a few minutes for questions. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so we're just, in terms of our recommendations, uh, we are calling for a gender focus in relation to any, any actions or, or initiatives in relation to, 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 to today's hearings and um, positive action to address the deficit in the area of policy and decision making for travellers. Um, we're, we're, we're recommending as an immediate first step a quota system for travellers on public decision and policy making structures. We're recommending an audit of the experiences of travellers who are now participating on these structures to see what their experiences are like and what kind of review of structures is needed. Um, sanctions for those on decision-making bodies who make anti-traveller statements or encourage anti-traveller statements to be made. Community development funding for autonomous, that's crucial, autonomous community work with travellers where travellers have an independent voice outside of the state. Um, Again, to highlight the public sector equality and human rights duty, that public bodies need to be brought up to speed on their uh, responsibilities under the Act and ensure that they operate in a ma manner consistent with the duty. We're calling for resources to traveller organisations to provide training on anti-racism to public decision-making structures. Um, also, the immediate uh, implementation and additional resources for the National Traveller Roma and inclusion strategy and also and I think this is one that that we all really need to kind of get behind I suppose is the development and implementation of a new national action plan against racism the last one finished in 2008 we need it for travelers and other minority groups thank you thank you very much now on to Mr Kevin Byrne CEO Exchange House Ireland Kevin Hello, first of all, I'd like to uh, thank the committee for inviting me here today. Uh, I'm here representing Exchange House Island and to add our voice to the excellent submissions you've already heard from uh, a lot of the partners we work with, uh, and I'm sure excellent submissions that you'll hear later today as well. Exchange House Island National Traveller Service is an organisation of travellers and non-travellers uh, and leading provider of frontline and support services to some of the most marginalised travellers in Ireland since 1980. We're a multidisciplinary frontline service 
and we provide education and training services, children and young people services, family support and crisis intervention services, addiction services and the National Traveller Mental Health Service. We also deliver partnership services through training, provision of expertise and dual working with other organisations to provide services to travellers in Ireland. Our aim is to break down some of the barriers and discri discrimination in order to facilitate travellers to access the range of services that they need in an equitable way. And I think that's one of the key things, is that we notice in our day-to-day -day work that it's not about travellers not trying or not, not wanting these changes to take place, but the barriers exist, and it's very, very difficult for them to, to break those barriers down without the support of some of these structures. And I'll go into that further. Uh, we utilise a distinctive multidisciplinary approach um, the, and we work with a service user group who often face multiple social issues and barriers. We, we have a skilled staff team throughout the organisation who can work with members of the Traveller community to escape positive outcomes. Um, I'll go on to We support a number of the recommendations to, that we've already heard today in relation to there being clear representation of travellers, whether that be in the Senate, whether it be in the Oireachtas, um, in the Dáil. We believe that there should be a rapporteur for uh, travellers to be appointed to the House of the Oireachtas. We believe that there should be, we should establish a specific national strategy to tackle travel unemployment with the pr priority requirement of statutory bodies, STEMI state agencies and public services to proactively employ, employ travellers. It's important that this is seen in the context of decades of exclusion, meaning that there has been multiple barriers, both tangible and intangible. We're coming from a point of view where that employment hasn't been there and hasn't been there for, for a long period of time. So therefore, the changes that we need to make are big changes. Without the big changes, it's, that's not going to happen. When a group have been excluded in the large part from this type of employment for years, it takes more than a slight opening up to change things. There needs to be a commitment and resources with high level support to harness the knowledge and skills that the members of the travel, travel community have. By putting in high level resources over the first years, it would mean that successes would then become the future support network as others follow in their footsteps. It is extremely important and it is, it is an example of if you don't see it, you don't think you can be it. We work with a number of young travellers within our organisation and we want to, we are constantly trying to show them that they can be these things, but without the support at a structural level, they're not going to believe that. We think we should hold to account the requirement of the public sector of duty and for the Minister of Social Protection to direct the establishment of a paid internship scheme across public bodies by directly targeting travellers. Without doing this, we don't feel that it's ever going to happen. You can, you can say that it's open to everybody, you can continue to, to, to make those claims, but without clear policies that are, are putting in place a pathway that, that, that's still not going to, take, to happen or take place. We also believe that we should look at the issue of hiding ethnic, hiding ethnic identity and why this is taking place. We believe that you should offer support networks to people in employment and apprenticeship roles so they do not feel isolated and they're able to voice the concerns and the barriers some of these concerns and barriers are the reasons why often people are hiding their ethnic identity, because they don't want to lose the position that they are in. Uh, we should be willing and able to address the inevitable bumps in the road without giving up on schemes or other people, uh, because this gives the message that you're happy to provide additional and well-needed support until things become difficult, and then it's no longer worth it. You've got, it's about sticking with it. It's about understanding that when you're trying to make a big change, when you're trying to to uh, involve people who have been excluded from society for such a period of time, there will be bumps in the road and we have to stick with these things. One of the things I, I, I looked at uh, in regards to getting more travellers onto, into employment and, and into roles where they can make a difference, um, if people may have heard of in the NFL American football, they had a problem with getting head coaches from minority backgrounds. And they, they implemented what was called the Rooney Rule, and under this rule, head coach positions they, uh, that, that became available, they had to interview candidates from ethnic minority backgrounds. A version of this or something similar would give opportunities of fair interview to travel candidates for statutory roles or internships. By offering the interview, the, even just the interview, you're making a change. This would mean that, you would gain, that people would gain experience of interviews uh, uh, and panels at that level 
and that it would mean that the people that are doing these interviews uh, and making these decisions would begin to see the talent that is there within the traveller community. This should be in addition to reserved job roles and internships for travellers, as without big changes like this, it will be impossible to reverse the decades of overt discrimination that has been faced. The benefits in regards to this would both uh, to both employment and relationships between travellers and the major majority population would be huge. I think it is only by getting prominent travellers who have the skills and the knowledge into these positions, working alongside the majority population, that is how you make the change to society that we all want to see. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Kevin. Now, uh, finally, Minnie Connors of the Wexford Traveller Community Group. Or, Traveller Development Group, excuse me. Sorry. Over to you. Thank you for inviting me here today to speak to you. You've already got the social and political submission from our group. Now I want to tell you the context of where they came from. I'm a 40-year-old traveller woman. I was brought up in a trailer with my parents, five brothers and seven sisters. They were the happiest days of my life, living out in the open air with our horses, dogs, chickens and goats and all my extended family around me. Back then, we lived without water, electricity, or toilets. My extended family are now living on the same site I was raised on, in four trailers without water, electricity, or toilets. So nothing has changed in a generation. I went to school in Wexford, the same school my five children have attended. When I left at the age of 12, I could not read or write. But in youth reach, I learned to read and write in a few weeks. The very same thing has happened to my children they have been treated as special needs from day one. They don't get the same lessons as other, as other children. They don't learn Irish. They don't get homework. They are told to colour in pictures, play computer games. They stay in at playtime to avoid discrimination. The same level of abuse and bullying is still there. If a child touched off me in school, they had to touch off on someone else to get rid of the traveller germ. A generation later, this is what my children experience every day. When I had three children, I was living happily in a caravan on the family site, when council officials told me that if we didn't leave, they would impound our caravan. I would have to go to a women's refuge with my three children, and my husband Jim would have to go into a men's hostel. Getting a landlord to rent to a traveller family is near to impossible. The council offered the alternative of going into a council house in a group housing scheme of 10 houses built especially for traveller families. All the other traveller families have been replaced by settled families and my family and I are now isolated on that scheme away from our own community. We accept that there are many things we need to change in our community and our culture. For example, we want to give travelling children the best chance in life. Yet there are priests in this country who charge 1,000 to 2,000 euro to perform fake marriages on underage traveller girls and boys, taking advantage of our anxiety about protecting our culture. I have had breast cancer. My GP did not examine me when I presented with a lump. He gave me antibiotics. I had to see five different doctors before I could get a mammogram. Then the cancer was discovered. I still have to have the support of settled friends to get doctors to treat me properly as a person. I am one of the 83% unemployed in the travelling community, claiming social welfare. When I attended a social welfare appointment recently, the officer tried to get me to sign a document I had not read. It was a contract with Taurus Nua to do a course I already completed the previous year. When I asked for time to read it, I was accused of pulling the traveller card. If I, didn't sign, I, if, I, if I didn't sign, I was told that an old signature of mine would be put on it. When I said I had the opportunity to do a counselling course to assist the traveller community suffering with mental health issues, she told me travellers don't want to work, they just want welfare. It is soul destroying to be treated in such a disrespectful way by a person in a government department. You are hearing from me today because my beautiful sister Alice took her own life last year. She was 24 years of age. She was the ninth suicide in my family in the last 30 years. Suicide in the travelling community is seven to ten times higher than in the settled community. In spite of this, governments do nothing to deal with the crisis. There was no help for Alice when her crisis arose. 
We were told half hour before she died that because it was a Saturday, she would have to wait till Monday to see her own family doctor. She had already seen her doctor two days before, to no avail. There is, no, there is still no support or help for our shocked and traumatised family. The school advised me to just act normal, although both my children had been in the house that morning when Alice was found dead. Healthcare professionals do not understand traveller culture. <coughs> One counsellor attend, I attended told me she had never counselled a traveller before and would need training to work with them. We all desperately need culturally appropriate mental health service. Our entire way of life is being stripped from us and we are still held in contempt by the settled community. Travellers have a fear of organisations like Tulsa. After my sister's death, I went to see the Traveller Mental Health Coordinator. Her response was to report to Tulsa that my family are living on a site without basic amenities. This filled us with fear that the children would be taken into care. This has been the experience of many traveller families in the past. As an example of traveller culture, horses hold a special meaning for us, but we are hounded for owning them. Last week, my brother's horse was legally grazing in a field when it was cut from its ropes and taken. Two days later, he traced it to the pound in Cork. He proved he was a legal owner, but then was told that she had died during the night at the pound, even though a vet had reported the horse in good health on arrival at the pound the previous day. To travel life in Ireland is a constant daily struggle to be treated with respect and dignity like everybody else. Every day it takes every ounce of our strength to battle against the feelings of shame and worthlessness that are heaped on us wherever we go. Recently I attended a party held for Syrian, Syrian refugees hosted by the local council. It was so nice to see them welcomed and their culture was being respected, but I could feel the hurt and disrespect that I had felt throughout my life. Why can't the same respect be there for me and for my people? Thank you. Thank you, Minnie, for that. And now I thank you all for your presentations. And uh, we'll go over to these illustrious people now on my right. Colleague, dear colleagues, all very welcome, of course, and thank you for your presence here today. And some of you, I'm sure, will have questions. And all I would ask is that you keep them very brief and to the point. So who would like to go first? Maureen, or sorry, Maura. Maura, and then... Oh, okay, you know, right, okay. Maura, Maura Devine. <laughs> Hi, how are you all? And uh, you're Kaylee LaFolche. You're very, very, very welcome. Um, I just have to commend, I suppose, the wonderful rapporteur uh, that is Colette Kelleher and uh, her establishment of the Oireachtas Committee the recent establishment of it, that I went to the launch of it. So let's hope we get somewhere um, with what today's proceedings will bring. Um, I, I, I'm picking up on a few points, just Kathleen, that you talked um, a bit about, I suppose, the surveys and the, the, the mental health issues. Um, I, I was post uh, this life for a long time, psychiatric nurse, so I have my own kind of issues maybe, but also looking in rep retrospective of how travellers are f treated within the health service that uh, Minnie so eloquently and, and sadly talked about, um, and the, the issues of traits that settled people see not belonging to them, but we actually begin to diagnose the traits of travellers as, a, as something apart and also as something in, in the psychiatric sense as something that needed to be treated. And I think we've come a long way since I started out as a student nurse, but we've still a long way to go. Minnie, your, um, your heartfelt story of access and health care for you, vital health care for yourself, for yourself. And the survey as well, the, the recent survey shown the, the increase and the massive suicide issue in, in the traveller community and is there one thing that can be done to get that message out there? I know a lot has been done around the circles but it's not impacting on the community itself um, it, it, in comparison also then I suppose with the prisoner issue for uh, John Lonergan and that um, a lot of mental ill health is 
kept captivated in the prison and that they're captivated and it's not treated as a mental health issue either. Uh, question, I know, I know, I know, I know, I know. Okay. Um, to go back to then the reduced timetable that is illegal in education, in post and primary schools and uh, absolute expulsion. And what you think and what you believe, Minnie, you talked about uh, schooling for your children and what you think, believe, would actually, how that impacts to, on your kids later in life to feel so different and to, um, to be alienated. I think alienation is, is one of the words that come, comes to mind in the massive implications of the negative uh, experiences in, in edu education. I know I have a lot. A accommodation, the underspend, 50%. I mean, my area, Dublin South Central, we had three. We had the one behind Guinnesses. We had um, St. Michael's Estate. But we have Labra Park, and it's redevelopment 15 years in the making, it's again, again stalled and 50% of those that, that goes back into the exchequer and surely we should, what do you think of penalising local authorities when they don't spend on traveller accommodation and also for the money that they don't spend, give it to councils that are willing and able to spend it as opposed to get it swallowed back up. It's all over the place but thank you. Yeah. Uh, Senator Aidan or Aidan? <clears throat> Thanks very much, and you're all very welcome here. It's, it's uh, a wonderful occasion. Some of you mentioned that it was historic, and I think it really is. And um, I want to thank Colette Callagher and the Civil Engagement Group for, for organising uh, organizing this and being to, uh, so, uh, so persistent in pursuing the, um, uh, the rights of, of, of the travelling community and, and, and travellers in this house um, since uh, for the last three years uh, the, that I've been here. Um, a few... You've mentioned a lot political representation in these houses, and uh, I think it's something that we want to support. Having a designated Shannon seat uh, for the travelling community, I think, would be an absolutely uh, excellent uh, idea. And we've mentioned it before in many different fora. H has it been examined as to how that would come into place? Does it require uh, overhauling of the entire Shannon electoral system? Does it require a constitutional amendment? Because it is a it's a feature of the Constitution, it's a constitutional house, or is it something that can be done much much simpler? Um, I prefer something that was written in stone rather than at the, at the whim of a Taoiseach, that, because that can change Taoiseach to Taoiseach, if you like. Uh, the second question I have is about um, uh, hate speech legislation. Uh, and we have struggled for a long time in getting around to... Um, to strengthening our hate, hate speech laws because there is a strong lobby that uh, promotes the idea of free, of free speech and that's understandable. Uh, but those who are at the rough end of hate speech are very vulnerable groups. Uh, and your community will be at the rough end of hate speech. There are journalists who can write things that are in any other country they wouldn't get away with, um, but they can write them in this country because of our, our hate speech laws. Uh, and there are political parties and, and political representatives within political parties who have said things that in any other country in the world would have, been, would have ended up in court. Um, so I want to ask those two specific things. One, about the, the mechanisms about how we can uh, enshrine that Shannon seat uh, for the travelling community as a, as, a, as a permanent seat in the House of the Rockets. But secondly, your views uh, on hate speech legislation and how we can uh, turn the tide on, on the racist views that are, um, that are given out uh, without check about many different uh, communities in, in, in Irish society, but particularly uh, the travelling community. But again, uh, last thing I would say is that of all the communities that I, I've worked with, and I'm sure my, my colleagues have, work, have worked with, um, the travelling community come back and back and back again to, to the table. They always come back to the table with solutions and with positivity, when often it would be an awful lot easier to walk away from the table and to believe that nobody will ever, ever listen, will ever, ever listen. So to that, I congratulate you, uh, and, and Thank you, I'm humbled by your, pre by your presence and by your presentations today. Thank you, Senator. We'll take one more for, for, for Francis. Uh, Senator John Dolan. From August, Lasca Hirlock, and um, I'm very happy to be here and be able to speak on this um, this have morning. You done, have you done, um, My thanks briefly to, to Senator Colette Kelleher um, for all the work she has done on this issue since the day she came into this house. Um, I want to particularly welcome someone that spent an afternoon in this chamber in June 2003. That's yourself, Rosalind, if you remember when both of us made presentations to the review, I think it was the number 11th review of the Shannon, or maybe it was the 12th or 15th, but anyway. Um, absolutely, we see, the, we see the results from it. Yeah. And, uh, but that's just to make the point 
that there has been an ongoing uh, um, um, wish yeah. to actually be able to play a stronger part in, 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 in the House of the Oireachtas. The Cahirlach is encouraging me. I'm, I'm, I'm going, I've loads to, of things I'm, I'm I'd love to very say, conscious of and the, the clock is bearing down. I want to get to these okay. people to have I, a few what answers. What I do is, I'm, I'm just going to posit uh, a couple of observations, and that there be questions out of that, between contributions made by two people in particular, Minnie Connors and John Lonergan. Minnie, first of all, I must remember your sister, and, we, and thank you for actually sharing that. We talk about suicide, but it's different when you talk about a person and their life and their relationship, uh, and that is a, a horrendous uh, issue. Um, I thought you captured the real day-to-day -day grind, education, housing, how over 40 years, uh, hard to see change, um, the, the health issues and whatever, and that I found the most compelling and grounded. Uh, across a range of, of, of presentations today. Um, John Lonergan, I thought you was, I thought John was tempting us to look at this issue in a way that maybe we haven't and to look at some aspects of it that haven't been given uh, enough consideration. And <laughs> Senator, when we'll have the report, I'm sure we'll have a debate. The, uh, forgive me, this, the uh, <laughs> questions. <laughs> I, and actually, believe it or not, I was getting... Not second stage speeches, <laughs> okay? Oh, well, speaking of which, and, um, but the, the... Many contributors today rightly made reference to different participation channels. But I thought what Minnie and John were getting at, or was helping me to understand more, how do we actually take an historic occasion like this, and this is my question, and actually make something of it? What's the game changer? Uh, we both, if you like, if you want to look at it as the settled community in Travers, have a problem here. That a lot of, uh, and I'm not saying there shouldn't be more um, processes and whatever, that they have not on their own shifted the actual lived experience of people. So I'm asking, what is it to do with trust? Is it to leave aside how we victimise, or it's their fault and we're the victims, or they're the victims and we're, and all the rest of it? Something like this, I feel, has to happen. And the core of that, I think, is can we chance trusting each other with oh. some things? Goramahogut, and I thank you most sincerely, Nesca Hero. Again, look, I'm very grateful. Everything everybody is saying is very important. This must be brief to the point, questions. And Senator Martin. I, I have to go, Cahillic, but I was okay. very keen just to commend the, the contributors, and particularly uh, Minnie. And, you know, this is a, we public, all commend them. This is a public session, and uh, I'm sure the people in Wexford, when it does hit the airwaves, as I've no doubt it will, will hold their heads in shame, because I think we need to look at laws where, when that type of thing does happen, uh, that these people can be brought uh, to account. So I suppose that is uh, the, the first point I wanted to make in terms of a question, uh, 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 look. And, and secondly, and I think this is the point as well, and I've experienced this myself, um, people who do uh, uh, try uh, uh, and assist uh, members of the travelling community end up getting, I suppose, harassed and harangued for doing so as well. I remember back in 2006, I think it was, I had a house uh, which I was very happy to rent to uh, uh, members of the travelling community who subsequently lived there for 10 years uh, very happily and there was no issue high up or low down as I knew there wouldn't be. Uh, but the amount of harassment uh, that I received uh, as a result of making the house uh, available to members of the travelling community was outrageous. And that gave me a very, very clear example of what members of the travelling community must suffer on a daily basis in terms of prejudice, harassment, um, uh, and dealing with a society that clearly uh, uh, hasn't uh, uh, lived up to its duties you, and Senator. responsibilities. And what I finally say uh, is, you know, well done for being here and people like Minnie. That's how you make the difference, because if you keep grinding away, eventually you will get a result. And we are here to help. Thank Come you. Senator Lynn Ryan. Thank you. Mind, 
about to stay seated if that's all right, since we're not in usual Which? business. I'd say seated if that's okay. Thanks. Of course. Yeah. Thank you, um, I have three three questions. Um, Bernard, you said something that really stood out to me around collusion, and I straight away zoned in on that. And I think um, I'd love for you to expand a bit more on that, because I know as a working class woman, I have felt, I, am I colluding? Am I actually becoming part of a system? Am I, is, this, is this all worth it? So I'd love for you to expand a little bit more on that, because I think it is very interesting. So Because if we don't see outcomes and we don't see change, is it actually collusion? Is it box ticking? Isn't it luck we spoke to travellers? And being able to point to these occasions that happen from time to time without ever seeing any real outcome or change in the equality of our conditions. Um, Patrick, um, thanks very much for, for your presentation. And I, I think I'm right in saying that you've done law for your, your primary degree, was it? History and economics, was it? Um, yeah, like I remember first meeting you, maybe when you were in second year or third year, it might have been an event that we were doing. I'd love for you to expand a bit more on the, sco the financial scholarship idea. Would that be institution, the educational institutions, or would that be like a national kind of your support system so that it's something that's run out nationally. Um, also in relation to education, I think, um, you know, over the next few years you will be heralded as, look, um, look what Patrick has done, he has a PhD, why aren't the rest of you getting that, right? That happens all the time. The person is held up as a weapon against their own community. And I think how important is it to keep battling back against that? Because we can keep saying that education is the way out but actually we make it impossible for people to engage in education. So we can say education all we want to minority groups, but that puts a personal responsibility on the person to just engage and get their education instead of actually acknowledging right back to the, the years of assimilation and oppression that actually stop us even getting to the point where we even consider education. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit how we get a little bit down further in terms of supporting people at the very basic community level before they can even begin to engage in, in an educational process. And the third, um, I think maybe, uh, maybe Martin, you can speak to it, but political representation. Um, I think it's obviously hugely important. I, I, I'm completely for positive discrimination when it comes to, so we can have gender quotas all we want, but if that 50-50% is made up of all affluent to middle class people, that 50-50 doesn't actually, actually matter whether it's men or women. And it's about what the representation is actually made up of. And in the last local elections, what really stood out to me was the amount of women that were put on posters by parties, but then not support. And I'm wondering, how can we ensure that if we move towards a place where we're encouraging, we're telling travellers they need to put themselves forward, but then we're not meeting with anything on the other side. And that fear, I suppose, of it becoming tokenistic in terms of travellers putting their names up on, on, on lampposts and posters, but actually then party structures and political structures still keeping every single support away from the travellers being able to actually have the support on a community network to actually be elected in the first place. So I think it's one, it's one thing putting women or travellers or working class people uh, out there for election, but if they're not actually met with the systems and structures to able to actually help them to get elected the way other people come together to get their friends elected. Like, I mean, there's a lot of mediocre people in here, but to be a working class person or a traveller traveller person, it's like you have to be exceptional. You have to prove yourself before you're even considered. And I I'm just wondering how can we move past that and acknowledge that actually a lot of people in here are just pretty average, really. Uh, there's nothing exceptional about any of us. And that there's so many people within the travelling community that are expected to do the most amazing things before they're even considered to be put on a ballot. Thank you, Senator, for your questions. And finally, a question from Senator Joe O'Reilly. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. And it would be important to show no displays of mediocrity after that. <laughs> but uh, so uh, we'll try to. Uh, to avoid that, no, well, thank you. Thank you for that endorsement. Uh, no, Chair, first of all, to say to, um, to our visitors, our traveller people who are with us today, you're very, very welcome. It is, as my colleague Aon said earlier, historic. It's wonderful that you're here. It's also wonderful that it's a public session. And I just want to warmly welcome you and endorse it and hope it's part of an ongoing dialogue. I commend my colleague Colette Kelleher. I had the privilege of serving on the Council of Europe with Colette, Senator Colette Kelleher for some time and I, I'm a first-hand knowledge of how proactive she is on issues and how really committed and sincere she is and this is a wonderful initiative of Senator Kelleher and I commend that. Um, I, I would say at the outset and I think we all have to say to you at the outset and I 
coming to a sequence of questions then. Uh, the, I, we I'd don't say, have all day, unfortunately. Uh, I anticipated your interruption. I have to come back to look. these good people so, for I'd brief closing comments. That, uh, we, you are the victims of prejudice and ignorance uh, on the part of our community, and I think we should begin by admitting that and that there is a lot wrong at our end, and I think it's an important starting point. And there's no point in dividing that or dressing, up it, dressing it up in any other forum. And we have a, known us as community leaders to try to lessen that. I served on the Traveller Accommodation Committee of my county council and worked to do that, and I taught a Traveller class. But I, I do think that we have a duty and I'm not, we're not all doing enough. I'm not doing enough myself, but we have a duty to break down those prejudices. Now, a couple Good of things to question. raise with you. I missed your contributions because I was travelling up from Cavan and unavoidably so. But uh, I'd like to again ask about the suicide issue. I mean, I, I heard, I gather from the questions that there was a very human, personal testimony there. It's, it's a very real issue. It's a, an issue in all communities, but I gather it's a very special one with you, tragically. Um, I personally think, and I, by way, I would say to you, the great empowerment and the great key to, if you like, emancipation, empowerment, self-development, power and strength in your communities is knowledge, is education. Therein lies the key. Sorry, I, sir, I'm coming We're to the to I do for 12 understand that you have a problem with, I understand you have a problem with bullying in secondary schools, but I'd like to ask you about the transition to secondary. How it, do you think that's evolving? And I think I felt as I left teaching that the stage where I was leaving, there was a movement into secondary education of a greater degree. And I know there's bullying there and there are all sorts of barriers, but I'd like to ask you about that. I'd also like to ask you, how do you deal with your minorities? within the travel community. How are you, how do you think you're performing in relation to LGBT rights, in relation to people, persons with disability, in relation to minorities? Because I always, and relation, I always felt, and I must say this with the greatest respect, that there was a level of hierarchical thing in your community too, which sometimes can be very damaging to weaker people. So how do you deal with that? That's in all our societies and wrong. But I'd be interested in how you deal with the challenges facing you there too. So basically, in Thank summation, you. it's great that you're here. I hope there's more days to come like this. And I don't think we're doing enough. I think we have to say publicly we're not. And we, you challenge us to do more. Well, and today, challenges us to do more. Thanks to our own rapporteur, Senator Collette. We're going to have a brilliant report, I've no doubt. That will be, that will be going to government. And there will be debate. I'm sure the leader will facilitate the debate. Obviously, he will on that. Now, I'm coming over to your good selves now. You've heard the questions. If you could find them in all of that, and I'd like to, in your brief, in your brief summing up, uh, you deal with anything you've heard. And I'll start with you, Mark. Uh, thank you very much, um, uh, Chair. Uh, just for, uh, before I respond to some of the questions, uh, it would be remiss of me if I didn't acknowledge uh, a number of people here today who have been really great champions of, of travel rights o over the years, and that would be Lynn, obviously, and Colette and Aon over there, who have been you know, very consistent in their support in advocating for travel rights. And just to say, it's really, really appreciated. We need that support uh, because we can't take this journey or take this challenge on our own. And it would be great if a lot more politicians showed some leadership and, and, and began to support and advocate for travel and Roma human rights. I, I would say, look, at, we're beyond the point of having to prove or provide more evidence that travellers continue to suffer oppression, exclusion and racism. We're really beyond that point. There's, in, there's independent evidence from the Human Rights Commission, from the ESRI and from in, internationally recognised uh, human rights uh, bodies. Uh, John was asking earlier on, what's the core issue? Or what's the big issue? Is it a lack of trust? Or, or what? Before we actually can begin to resolve the issues, there has to be an acknowledgement and there has to be an agreement and a consensus on what the core issue is, what the core problem is. And the core problem here is, and this is where we need leadership, it has to be named, the core problem is racism. Racism, without a shadow of a doubt. Racism at both the individual level and the institutional level. And sometimes our political establishment is actually complicit in perpetuating that racism. And we see the manifestations of that racism. Uh, many and others spoke about suicide. That's a manifestation of the racism. 
The poor living conditions is a manifestation of the racism. The low educational attainment, high unemployment rate, these are all manifestations of the individualised and institutional racism. So if we're serious about addressing and, uh, these issues and supporting the inclusion of travellers and respecting the human rights of travellers, let's name it for what it is and stop pussyfooting around. That's one issue I would say. The, 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 in relation to Adon, um, in relation to the uh, seats, let's be realistic. It's a good symbolic starting point if there's a traveller in the Shannon, you know, nominated by the Taoiseach or by some other means. But that on its own will not be a panacea. That, you know, it's a good starting point. It's not going to be a panacea. It won't re resolve all the issues. We still need a so-called participative democracy, you know, the national and local consultative committees dealing with health, education, and, and so forth. Uh, so let's be, reali re be realistic about that, because when traveller ethnicity was acknowledged on the 1st of March 2017, somehow or another, a very unrealistic expectation was created in the community that suddenly the, the symbolic recognition of traveller ethnicity will resolve all of the issues that we're facing. That hasn't happened happened and it's not going to happen. In fact, the travellers are feeling very let down and very disillusioned as a result because the recognition hasn't really translated into rights on the ground for travellers. But in relation to the Shannon seats, I certainly would agree with you, Aidan, rather than leaving to the whim of the Taoiseach of the day, I think if that could be copper fastened from a legislative point of view, uh, whereby it's, it's guaranteed on an ongoing basis, I, I certainly would uh, favour uh, that option. And, and certainly what you do want for travellers who are, taking, uh, who are participating in the political system, you, you don't want tokenism. That's absolutely not something that you want. So the proper and appropriate support systems and structures need to be in place to ensure that whoever the travellers are who are, who are participating either in the Shannon or the Dáil are, are, are participating in a meaningful uh, and indeed in, in, a, in, a, in a significant way. And lastly, in relation to the LGBTI, uh, uh, of course there are challenges and there are issues in our community and we, we would be the first to say it in terms of you know, um, um, feuding, issues around children's rights, LGBT issues. And to be fair, travel organisations have gained the maturity and the confidence and the skill set to be able to look at these issues and try and deal with them. And I know Chris is here from the National Travel Mediation Service and he'll be speaking later on about some of these, about some of these issues. But just to give you an example of some of the progress we have made, one day a few weeks ago we had at least 50 travellers and non-travellers who are working with travellers taking part in Dublin Pride. 10, 15 years ago, that wouldn't have happened. That's just an indication. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's by any means resolved. We have a long way, a long journey ahead of us. Thank you, Martin. Can I have a brief comment and answer to any of the questions there from you, Patrick? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, in regards to your first question, then, uh, regarding should it be a national scholarship or an institution, why, of course, it would be look great if each, every university did offer one? I think it would work best if it was a national scholarship. I don't think it should matter that I went to Trinity or if I went to UCC or NUIG or Maynooth or Limerick. It's, that should, I think that's actually, I think, completely wrong approach, whereas it should be a national program that travellers because you can apply to. And then, of course, that might cover fees and offer maintenance. In regards to your second question, in regards to, obviously, I mean, it's quite a good point, actually. When I do finish, even, even right now, it's quite easy for you to put on a pedestal and to be used as a stick to beat others, or to be quite simply in something I'm quite aware of, even just my, my own tokenism. If, if I'll probably, I'll go well, probably be the first traveller for PhD from Trinity, and that'll probably be quite tokenistic for quite a long time. And I think the big step for emphasis sort of primary and sort of secondary education is. I've been quite fortunate in my circumstances in a way that perhaps others have not been. I've never had a teacher at primary or secondary level never tell me I couldn't do anything, that this wasn't for me. And I think the main issue is, of course, and of course, even Minnie said about her, about her you know, children being sort of, you know, reduced hours, I never had reduced hours. And that also can make a huge difference. In primary school, I was taken out for an hour a day for separately. Which, which in hindsight was part because of my own background rather than actual need. And I think in some ways the big issue is it comes to teachers themselves and how, it's, how are travellers treated in the classroom from a young age. If they feel bullied, if, they think, if they're told they're different, they're, not, they're going to be less likely to continue. And I think there needs to be an encouragement that education does not need to mean university education. I know I'm, I myself have pursued university education, but that education can mean... It can be apprenticeships, it can be other careers. It should, obviously, people should be encouraged to complete the primary and secondary education. But the, 
the end all, the end all everything should not necessarily be a university education. There are other career paths that require an education. I think, and this is obviously an issue that, is, that doesn't just apply to travellers, it applies to the population in general. Education does not purely mean university. It's, it's quite for, it's quite variety, whether it's an apprenticeship or university or other forms. Thank you. Uh, Kathleen. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just uh, maybe reply on, um, on three separate questions, if I can. Uh, the, the first one would be around mental health, because I was asked a specific question on that. Um, the expert here on travel and mental health is Thomas McCann, who's going to be talking in the afternoon. Um, he, he works. By the way, it's supposed to be starting yeah. five yeah. minutes ago. Yeah, but, but, I don't but, know what I'm going to do. I had second stage speeches over here. I've asked everybody to be as brief as possible, and it's your right now to respond. To the questions. And, I, I, and again, I'm going to try and keep this very, very, very brief. Oh, yeah, that you know, be to, to, to understand, to, to look at mental health or suicide and just take it in, as, a, as a separate issue, we're never going to get anywhere with that. Suicide is, um, is a result of underlying issues. Now, for we can't turn around and say that every suicide is caused because of the same things, because there's lots of different reasons for it. But there's no doubt about it, and we can take uh, out of the equation um, the, uh, the discrimination, the racism, um, the exclusion, the lack of unemployment opportunities and the lack of education and attainment that our community has, has received. So we can't t t look at it in isolation. It's, all, it's a symptom of a much, much bigger problem and we have to address the bigger problem and that the bigger problem is exclusion and discrimination against, uh, against the travel community. I just got an opportunity, Sorry. I was late coming up, but I'm just here to <coughs> welcome you. Sorry, Senator, I'm just welcome you to the meeting. Senator, please. And I agree with Senator. Please, this Senator, means so Senator, much what you said. Senator, please, and please respect the chair. We've had questions. It's now up to all of these good you, people. Who so you're telling me I am being silenced as a member not, of this you're house? You're not. You have use. time. Just but hold on. Hold, the contributions. Hold on, and now you're coming in and interrupting their responses. Yeah, well then stay quiet till the next session then. This session starts at 10 o'clock. I want to be here and say that I I Senator. Thank you. Speech, Senator, please not be disorderly. Look, I'm trying to conduct very, this yeah, thing sensibly. Awesome. Sorry, yeah, and forgive that interruption. It's brief. Sorry, Kathleen. No, that, Kathleen is answering that, questions. That, Sorry, sir. Okay. This is a public okay. consultation. Senator, please, please. To come back Kathleen. to how do we address it? How do we, 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 we address it? We have to start looking at how do we address We need to be dealing with traveller children getting meaningful education. We're continuing seeing traveller children coming out of school who can barely read and write. Um, so that needs to be addressed, and we need to be understanding of why that is. You know, there's been a lot of discussion recently around the reduced timetables. Um, but again, that needs to be addressed. You know, if we want people to be able to access, we're, we're one of the most developed countries in, in, the, in the world. People are coming from around the world to come here for to have, uh, create, have, have better opportunities. Yet we have 84% unemployment within our community. We also have, it's not just a travel community, there's working class areas that have high levels of uh, unemployment as well. There's people who are getting left behind. So we need to be addressing making sure that we have positive discrimination around employment. But we also need to be assessing children so that they are getting proper education, that they can attain that. So, so, so that's part, that part of it. To look to the question we were asked around, we would say uh, travellers' representation around a, a Senate seat. Um, we, we wouldn't, you know, we want a tr tr in, the, in the long term, and when I say in the long term, in the, over the next year, to, uh, year or so, we would hope that we would be able to work towards within the national organisations and the local travel groups to build a travel constituency where every traveller will have the right to vote for a traveller who's representing them in, so if, the, you know, with the help of God, we're going to be getting uh, a Senate seat. And if we are, we'll put forward a number of travellers, or travellers can put themselves forward, but the travel community will vote on, uh, on that. Um, but we don't want it simply to be looking at one Senate seat. We need to be having travellers represented where the political decisions are being made, and that's on local and government and national government. I'm going to come back to a point that I made earlier. There is, without a doubt, there is no community in Ireland 
who has ever been as negatively affected by, uh, by political decisions and political indecisions as what the traveller community have. We need positive discrimination. We need to see seats that are dedicated and allocated for travellers um, within that. But we also need to be providing training. And one of the things that Minka Whitten did is that around the conference as well, we put together videos of educating travellers on why you should uh, register to vote, how you get registered to vote, and how you cast your vote. We have to look for where people are at. And people who are being excluded from the political system or haven't been part of the political system, they don't understand the mechanics of it. So we need to be start looking at it where, where, where they're at. And I hope that answers the question. Over to you, uh, Bernard. John. Oh, sorry, forgive me. John. John. Um, my, my very, very, uh, yeah, very, very, very briefly. I am. Um, I, I, I you, then, Bernard. I, very, very if you can pick up on any questions there, John, and answer them briefly. Yeah. I very, appreciate it. Very, very briefly. I, I think you know, in terms of education, I'm a great believer in in the broader sense, and I totally agree with Patrick in relation to education. But if we are not getting primary education right, uh, and if the experience that has been expressed here this morning is is is, why, is more widespread than in the case, and I believe it is, well, then that for me is where it all begins and ends, because the, the child's experience of education must be a positive one, and if, unless that is the case, well, then education is and uh, is, is going to suffer. So I'm a great believer in that. It must be a happy experience. It must be an inclusive experience. And we must uh, and, uh, you know, put the emphasis on that. When the child starts off in primary education, that is where it all begins. And if that's a good experience, everything, and I totally agree with you, Patrick, in relation to you know, this idea that it has to be third level. It does not. Uh, education is a way broader than that, and, and it's way more significant than that. And for young children, it must be that it's a normal thing to do, like everybody else. And there is a connection between extreme poverty and education, and that's where I highlighted in Mount Jai many years ago. The poorer your co area you come from, the less opportunity you have in education. That is a fundamental uh, discrimination, and it's not exclusively for travellers, but they are a big sufferer. So. Thank you very much. Bernard, as brief Thank as you. you can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kerr Um Just in terms of the um, commentary and uh, just around the diversity and equality within the travel community, I would say yeah, we have obviously come so far, but uh, we still have a long way still to go. Um, but at the same time, I think the traveller community have to led the way in terms of human rights, equality, participation and inclusion. And I think the wider community have a lot to learn from the traveller community in terms of progressing and going forward. Um, in terms of Lynn Luan's question just around the inclusion, um, I think that's an important question, Lynn. Um, in terms of participation, where do you stop in terms of outcomes? So people, the traveller community and travel activists have been engaging in you know, all these different structures and, be, and have been asked to engage. But the big question then is in, in terms of the implementation of policies, um, and that policy is in terms of task force report um, in 1995 and all the recommendations that came out of that. We haven't seen all the recommendations from that being applied. So that's what I mean by in terms of you know, participation and inclusion in terms of outcomes. There has been poor outcomes for the, the amount of time Time and resources that we put into it. But I think in terms of we are, there is pro progress, but I think we need to see a lot more progress in terms of real change in terms of outcomes, because it's not acceptable in terms of suicide, it's not acceptable in terms of housing crisis, it's not acceptable in terms of people, you know, in terms of racism and exclusion. So all of those issues are at a crisis point for the community. Um, but yeah, that's, that's my contribution. Thank you very much. Have you anything briefly for the thread, Joanna? Yeah. Um, I'd just like to say uh, there's just two parts. Um, in regards to the underspend of the travel accommodation budget, I do agree that there needs to be consequences and accountability there, but it shouldn't be that, uh, at the detriment of the traveller community. It, should, it, it shouldn't be taken from one of local authority and brought to another. It should be spent in the, in the actual authority, local authority that it's being given to. But what should happen is the accountability and consequences should not be to the traveller community, but to the authorities who are refusing to spend it on the much needed traveller culturally appropriate accommodation. The local authorities should be held to account, there should be consequences to them. It should not be spread around and it definitely should not be given back because we have all seen the consequences that comes from that. And as far as the hate speech legislation, we as travellers, I know myself and I'm no, I wouldn't be alone in saying this, have experienced um, hate speech in a way that would not be acceptable to 
other people in this, uh, this country, let alone in other parts of the world. Um, and my own, my own view on that would be that there needs to be um, a code of conduct put in place. There needs, people need to be le led by example from the government, from the local authorities and down, and there needs to be um, a code of conduct put in place, but also the development of the national anti-racism strategy um, would definitely be essential to addressing that. And we definitely need to develop and enact the hate, um, the hate crime legislation where travellers are named, like I said earlier. So. Thank you. Fraser and Anne, have you a brief point? No, okay. Anne, sir? We're happy to concede to traveller colleagues. Sorry, Anne? We're happy to concede to traveller colleagues in responses. You're happy to? Concede to. Yes, of course. Colleagues. And anyway, anything that's overlooked here, I'm sure can be taken up in the dialogue and traveller social inclusion when we get to that. So next is um, Kevin, is Kevin point? yeah. Have you a brief point? Yeah, just, just very briefly that. Um, on the matter around uh, collusion, um, I'd just like to say that the only way past that is for uh, members of the travel community to be in positions to be working alongside the majority counterparts. Because the more experience that people have of working alongside people from the travel community, the more they'll recognise that the contribution they have, the knowledge and skills that they have, and that immediately breaks down those negative stereotypes. So getting travel people into those positions, that's how we stop that from happening. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Minnie, you've got a few questions. Yeah. Couldn't get them all at one time. Um, um, I think I'll talk about the schools, for so the children in schools. Um, as a mother of five, um, my oldest daughter, she's 18, and then the youngest is, is 10 in September. Um, they got the very same schooling as I got. Very same. No difference. In the same school, same, they were treated the same. They got the very same thing. The way I was treated, I looked at my children being treated in the school. I suppose to give you a, a better sense of a challenged child, the way you can imagine how a challenged child being four-year-old without ever going to school, right? And they thinking that they're so proud of who they are. They're so proud of their mommy and daddy, their brothers and sisters. They're so proud of all their horses, their dogs. They're proud of that. Then they're so excited to go off to school, their first day in school their new uniform on them, their school bag on their back, and they're heading off for their first day in school. The very first day that child will write that door to school, that child is given a special needs teacher. That child is treated different by the teacher. Then the other classmates will say, my teacher is treating you different, so you're different. So you're different now in baby infants, and you will be different up until sixth class, so you're going nowhere in your life. So all the ch challenge child wants to do then is fight to get out of school fight to get out of school any way they can. My children sit in their class before they go out to play. They choose to sit in the class because they, don't, they have no friends. Born and reared in Wexford, born and reared and went to the same school as their mammy went to. And their children have no, con they have no um, connection at all in the school, across nothing. Um, I think if, if we were to try and do something, it would have to be, we'd have to have travellers in, in the schools. But I think, a small step would be having teachers getting culturally appropriate training around travelling children and around travellers. And, and just be kind to them, like let them know that they are human that they, and let them know that it's not going to be a waste of their time if they, tr if they teach the child like all the other children in school. So. Thanks, Minnie. You're, you're okay. Thank you very much. Now, on behalf of the Shannon Public Consultation Committee, I'd like to thank all of you. Uh, for your presentations here today. It's been both informative and productive, I believe. A good session, and I think we all learned from your insights and observations. Full account will be taken of all today's discussions when a draft report has been prepared by Colette, and copies of the final, final report will be sent to all contributors. Now, I would propose that we suspend with Deal with Traveller Dialogue and Social Inclusion starting at half past 12 if that's agreeable, and I would ask the Leader of the House, Senator Jerry Buttermore, if he would, move the suspension until... I'll so move, Cahirik, yeah. So Is that move. agreed?